sing out and hey, you got your book open. Page number two comes right after page number one. <laughs> All right. Here we go.
We'll do the first and last. Um, to give us an overview of what we have seen in the last few weeks and to help us to think about what's happening in the next few weeks, uh, I'm just going to take a quick glance at chapters at chapters 1 uh, through 9 there. In Joshua chapter 1, uh, we have the commission of Joshua. He's told to be strong and have good courage. He's told to obey God's word. In chapter 2, what we saw two weeks ago was the conversion of Rahab. She goes from being a harlot to a believer to the ancestor of Christ. Today, we're dealing with uh, the crossing of the Jordan, where hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Israelites will be crossing the Jordan River miraculously. In chapter 4, a memorial is constructed. Two memorials are actually constructed. Uh, they're there in this chapter, and one of those might seem rather odd to you, what God asked, Mo, uh, what God asked Joshua to do. Uh, then in chapter 5, we see circumcision and the captain. Uh, we'll just save all that because that's a lot to go into um, Chapter 6, the chapter that uh, most people that don't even know the Bible know something about, it has to do with the conquest of Jericho. We've looked at half of that chapter already as it dealt with Rahab. Uh, we see the consequences of sin in the camp. In chapter 7, what happens? Israel executes the sinner and then returns as a winner. In chapter 9, we see the cunning of the nation of the Gibeonites. And that will be our next to last week in this study. Not all those are necessarily going to be its own uh, message. Next week will more than likely combine chapters 4 and 5. Uh, but that uh, brings us, uh, we'll have one more message following chapter 9 to sort of recap what happens to the rest of the book of Joshua. Now, right here in chapter 3 tonight, I want you to th this morning, I want you to think about there being three distinct phases in what we might call the exodus of the Israelites. So to put a map up here, uh, we'll get the title of tonight's, today's message, Crossing into the New. Crossing into the New is what uh, we see is the title there at the top of your outline. And I want us to think about there are a number of new things that happen. Not all of those will be looked at this week, uh, but we're going to understand the meaning behind this phrase and what this has to do with us. This is more than just a history lesson on ancient Israel. There are applications for us as they crossed over into the new. So if we're obedient to God, we need to cross over into the new as well. Three distinct phases of the Exodus. And we look at the land masses here. We see that the Israelites, first of all, we know that they started there in Egypt. Well, they started up here. They went to Egypt, and they were delivered at the beginning of the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 12 to be precise, from Egypt. Let my people go. God lets his, God, uh, Pharaoh lets God's people go. And they cross over the Red Sea, whether this is the exact spot or not um, is yet to be determined, but it's a likely place. They cross over, they leave Egypt, they go into the wilderness and spend some time there, 40 years all total. 
And then uh, where we are today is they're at the town here of Shatim, and they will be crossing, or, or they're in the establishment there, the area of Shatim, not necessarily a town. Uh, we'll see what that word means in just a minute. They're going to cross over the Jordan River here. Three distinct phases, Egypt, wilderness, promised land. And separating each of those is a body of water. You've got the Red Sea, the first, uh, the first body of water that God miraculously opened for the Israelites. And then the Jordan River, which He also miraculously opens for the Israelites. And in that, these are pictures of the Christian life. Things that we will look at in the Pentateuch, Pentateuch, Penta 5, first five books of the Bible, and Joshua. So, remember these Israelites started in Egypt. At least where our series uh, would have started anyway. Egypt is a type of the world. Egypt is where the lost person is. God is, God is it was never been God's will for Israel to go to Egypt. Israel, each time they lack faith in God during a famine, uh, or during some other crisis, always headed down to Egypt, but that's a picture of the world. They left Egypt to go to the wilderness and pass through the Red Sea. Uh, crossing the Red Sea is a picture of salvation in these books that we look at here. Think about how God parted the Red Sea for them. He sent an east wind that blew all night and dried the ground so that they crossed over on dry land. God performed the miracle and they walked through it. That's a picture of our salvation. God does all the work. Man simply has to say, I'm willing to go. I'm willing to pass through this water. I'm willing to pass through to the other side. So then after one has left the world, has been saved, the picture there being of crossing the Red Sea, the next place that we see there is the wilderness. The wilderness in the books of Exodus through Deuteronomy pictures a saved but aimless lifestyle. The Israelites, if they were to have made the shortest trip from Egypt to the Promised Land, it would have taken them a total of 12 days. God prevented them from going directly along the route by the sea where the Philistines were. In God's plan, He had it set up for them to spend roughly two years in the wilderness, in their growth process, receiving the law, and overcoming some difficulties. Two years in the wilderness. Two years as young, immature Christians. Before they would have been able to enter the promised land. But Israel, remember, once they sent spies, once they checked out the land, said, no, we're not going over. We're not going to do this. We'd rather just sit here in this wilderness. And God says, okay, have it your way. And they spent, all those adults spent the remainder of that time, 38 years, in a wilderness kind of lifestyle. We will talk about some of the details of that wilderness in just a little bit. And so then, crossing the Jordan, that's the next item on the menu. What does crossing the Jordan mean for believers? Well, what is Canaan? That will help us understand that. What is the promised land for believers? Canaan itself, the victorious Christian life. Again, it was God's will for Israel to enter Canaan much earlier than they did. It is God's will for you to enter into the victorious Christian life much faster than the flesh wants to. In fact, the flesh will never want to. The flesh doesn't want to change. The flesh resists change. The flesh resists submitting to God. Canaan represents the victorious Christian life. So the process that we're talking about today of crossing the Jordan River talks about moving from the defeated, complaining, unhappy Christian life and crossing the Jordan River to achieve all the things that God wanted you to. There are songwriters who try to place Canaan as a place where there's no problems and everything is great and they write... Canaan as heaven in their songs. But it's not. 
Uh, on Jordan's stormy banks I stand, and cast a wistful eye to my, I'm leaving out some words, to my eternal home where my possessions lie. Canaan is not your eternal home. Canaan is the promised land, but there are giants and there are battles to be fought. And whenever you're living in the victorious Christian life, you understand that to have victory, that means you fought something. It doesn't mean there's no conflict. It means that you fought and you came out on top. It's just like uh, there's, uh, I worked in college athletics for a number of years. And one of, the, uh, one of the running jokes at one of the campuses there in South Carolina, a small Division II school, Erskine College uh, has as, as one of their slogans, uh, undefeated in college football. They don't have a college football team. Uh, they may have played some back in the 20s, but they don't have a college football team. But they have, you know, emblazoned on a humorous shirt, Erskine football, undefeated since 1927 or something like that. Well, if you don't fight, you can't win. So in Canaan, there will be battles. But the battles will result in victory if you fight them the right way. <clears throat> so we begin to look in Joshua 3. Let's read some of these verses together. Uh, we will look almost through the entire chapter, saving the last verse for the next chapter for the next message. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim, and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. Um, I do want to show you one more, uh, one more map before we go, uh, before we go too far. <clears throat> there are a few things that I want to point out here. So, what you're seeing on this map are some conquests that happened um, some conquests that happened after what we're reading about here. So don't pay any attention to any of those to any of those red lines, except for the one that we have right here, passing over here. And the next um, the next thing after the Jordan River is for them to face off against Jericho. Um, the first arrow pointing to the north uh, would have been uh, victories over uh, Sihon and Og, Sihon lower and Og defeating the Amorites, and then they move into the land, and that's their pattern to take most of the Southland first and then for the rest of the tribes to occupy what they want to there. Um, I want you to look at this map for just a minute so you can understand something here. Uh, you see the Jordan River that they're crossing, the blue line right down right down the center there. Uh, you see in the uppermost section there uh, the Sea of Chinnereth or the Sea of Galilee as we know it in New Testament times. Uh, there is a portion of the Jordan River that extends on the other side, further north than that, but to get it all in the space that I wanted, I wanted to you, don't, you can't see it. Uh, so then at the bottom there of the Jordan River, you see the Salt Sea, or the Dead Sea, as it's known. And understand the Jordan River flows from north to south. There is a section, like I said, of the Jordan River that feeds into, uh, that feeds into uh, the Sea of Galilee. And then water runs from there and runs into the Dead Sea where there is no outlet. And that's why it's full of salt. That's why it is... It is um, not a pleasant place to, uh, not a pleasant place to live. Nowhere that you want to swim. Uh, understand something here too. The Jordan River is not only fed by the Sea of Galilee. What is happening here? This river is in the middle of the Jordan Rift Valley. There's mountains on both sides. So during the winter, those mountains are filled with snow, and whenever it begins to warm up, when it begins to get springtime that snow melt pours down and causes the Jordan to flood and overrun its banks. The Bible will make reference here to Jordan overflowing its banks in the harvest. And of course, the time period we're about to read about is not going to be the harvest because the Israelites will celebrate Passover, which we know happens in our spring. Uh, they're going to celebrate Passover for the first time in many years, and they'll do that right here. So this obviously has to deal with a winter harvest, keeping in mind um, not every place has the climate of England, uh, not every place has the climate of wherever you grew up in the United States, and this is a much more tropical uh, or at least subtropical climate uh, where they would be able to grow crops year-round. Now, I do want you to note the city there called Adam. Oh, I pressed the wrong thing. Come back. Will you come back? Can I get it back? I can get it back, yes. Uh, the city of Adam. You may say, well, that looks like Adam. Well, it is, but if we said uh, Adam in the same way that uh, the Hebrews did, we would say Adam. Uh, that city is going to be important later. 
This is roughly 20, 18 to 20 miles upstream from where Israel is going to cross the Jordan River. Like I said, it'll be important in just a minute. Understand something. I'm going to put up uh, some information in just a second, but I want to challenge your thinking with one thing. Where is the promised land? Uh, basically, it's your, your greenish area here. Uh, Israel would also eventually conquer the land of the Philistines, but this is your promised land. Egypt was way down here. Wouldn't there be a simpler way to get into the promised land rather than to go uh, east of everything and then cross the Jordan River? Sure, they could have come in down here at Kadesh Barnea where they started out. Uh, they could also go north of the Sea of Galilee and come around. But they're going to pass through. It's not absolutely essential that, they, Jordan, that the Jordan River be parted for them to pass through, but God had a purpose in doing so. And I want us to talk just a minute about those purposes. Why would God have them cross the Jordan River when there would be an easier way possibly to go? Well, first of all, God wanted the Israelites to honor Joshua the same way as they did Moses. Uh, we won't look at all these verses. We will read verse 7 of chapter 3 a little later. Uh, but I just want to lay a little groundwork for what we'll be preaching in the next couple of weeks. Uh, God brought them through the Jordan River as a token to show Israel that God had the power to deliver the Canaanites into their hand. If God can control the flow of a river, then can He not interfere in the battles of mankind? He wanted to test the faith of the people as well as the priests, which we will see later in this chapter. Uh, he wants to, you'll find in chapter 4, create a permanent reminder of God's power for generations to come. Uh, another purpose of them crossing the Jordan River is to strike fear into their enemies. Chapter 5, verse 1, when the people of the land heard that God had parted the Jordan for them, then they, they, had, they melted, their spirit melted within them. There was no will to fight. They knew they were defeated foes. And then also to expedite entering the land to fulfill the prophecy. God had a very specific time for Israel to enter the land, and He made sure that they did it exactly on time, and He parted the Jordan River to make that happen. If the wilderness represents a saved but aimless lifestyle, and let's be honest, we've probably all seen believers who exist in this state. They claim to be saved, but they're still entangled in things of the world. They still look back fondly on what was enjoyed in Egypt, complain about every little thing. Their natural state is unhappy, and they seem quite happy to be unhappy, or at least comfortable there. And the deal is that they have just enough religion, if I can use that phrase, to take them to heaven, but not enough to cause them to be true disciples. Last Sunday we preached about real discipleship. They seem to have uh, this sort of statement, God can save me, okay? I'm just not willing to go crazy deep into this stuff. And the rest of their life is like a holding cell until God takes them home to heaven. But understand, even if you look at that map, just on the other side of the Jordan River, there was a life of contentment, a life of happiness, a life of joy, one that isn't marked by discord and strife and murmuring and complaining. It's one where you can have true peace with God and peace with man. It's experiencing real closeness with God. And it's just a river away. People stay on the east side of Jordan because it's easier to stay there unchanged than it is to make the effort to cross. So the title of the message is Crossing into the New. How do I cross into the new? How do I have a victorious Christian life? We read verse 1 already, read verse 2, and it came to pass after three days that the officers went through to the host. First of all, we notice that Joshua rose early. There is some value in rising early. They removed from Shittim. Literally, the meaning of the place is thorns. <laughs> Wouldn't you be complaining and unhappy and unsettled if you were in thorns? Steve and I played around disc golf yesterday, and 
And uh, one of us <clears throat> kept throwing his disc over into the nettles. Who likes nettles? Anybody a fan? No. It's uncomfortable. It's painful. <laughs> Israel was in a place of pain, thorns, and they needed to move. Sometimes we don't move until we feel the pain. Um, three days, it says there. Uh, we find three days in Scripture a lot. The third day referenced quite a lot. I wonder why that is. I wonder if that's a picture of anything. You know anything about a third day? <laughs> Something that happens after three days? Yes, we sure do. Uh, verse number three now. And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you should remove from your place and go after it. What's the Ark of the Covenant? Jed gave a Sunday school message this morning about the Ark. That's a different Ark. That was the Ark that bore people. What's in the Ark of the Covenant? There are three items in there. What are they? Anybody know? Uh, Aaron's rod that budded. That's one. The two tablets of stone. And a jar of manna that symbolized God's provision for the Israelites during their wandering in the wilderness. The Ark of the Covenant symbolized God's presence quite often in the New Testament. These officers give sound advice. What they say there? When you see the Ark of God, the priest bearing it, you should remove from your place and go after it. If we want to have Christian victory, if we want to live the victorious Christian life, if we want to cross into the new, the first thing that we need to do is we need to follow God wholly. We must follow God wholly. Yeah, yeah, okay, I get it. Follow God, sure. That's what we all do. We're here at church today. We're following God. This is what He wants us to do. But what does that really mean on a day-to-day -day basis, following God? I think that the easiest thing for us to do in following God is to follow the God-man, Jesus, God in the flesh. To do everything that Jesus modeled for us. What did Jesus do? Did He do this? Did He do that? How did He respond in this situation? However Jesus responded, however Jesus acted, is the right way for us to act. That's the right thing for us to do. We must follow God wholly. We will see as we read through this that we find obedience stressed again and again in, chat, in verse 2, verse 3, verse 6, verse 8. Everyone down from the lowest person, the lowest rank, all the way up to the priests had some obeying to do. <clears throat> verse 4 now. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, talking about the Ark of the Covenant, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way heretofore. Verse 4 has a couple of very important lessons for us. We look at that part where it says, Come not near unto it. 2,000 cubits. A cubit was roughly the length of the average man's fingertip to his elbow. Roughly 18 inches. Therefore, if we're talking about 2,000 cubits, we're talking about 3,000 feet. That's how far they were to stay back from the Ark of the Covenant. That's more than half a mile. We're, we're keeping quite a distance here. Can I still make sure that I can even see it? You'd have to be focused in to make sure that you could still see the ark in front of you. Why did God command for them to follow it at a distance? Because we must have a healthy fear and respect for the things of God. <clears throat> a healthy fear and respect. There are... Um, I've been in multiple churches, and, and uh, there are some who have a very, uh, a very, um, uh, some pastors who have a very uh, strict um, set of behavior for the sanctuary. If you guys think I'm strict, you haven't seen anything. Uh, since this is a multiple use hall and it's used for a number of things, I can understand sometimes a lot when the chairs are gone and we think, okay, we're just gonna we're just gonna make chariot races around the top of the wall. I get it. Um, once we're set up for church, we're treated like a church. But there are some pastors that take this to the ultimate extreme. I was in a church once. Should I sell this example? 
I've already started. It's too late. I can't take it back. Uh, where once you left from Sunday school to go into the main service, that he had requested that once you enter into the sanctuary, five minutes, ten minutes, two minutes before you come to service, that at that point you were to come in and be quiet, to not even have small talk. If you were going to do anything, just sit and, and pray or read through the scriptures or something like that. That was what he wanted to do. Um, I like fellowship. I like for us to get together and talk and see things. I mean, his philosophy was not that you shouldn't talk, but just do it out in the foyer, do it in the vestibule or whatever. But uh, nonetheless, I do think that there's something to be said for having a healthy fear and respect for the things of God. Think about the ark, first of all. How many men throughout the course of history died or were smitten with disease because they touched the ark of God or they looked into the ark of God? Uh, we find in 1 Samuel both of those things happening. Uh, the priesthood. Do you realize that God punished two kings severely for attempting to take on the role of a high priest? Saul was one. Uzziah was the other. God says, my priests are set apart. It's not for a non-priest to do the things that I've given him to do. Uh, we think of God's leaders that he had set apart, particularly Moses. God did not permit Korah to rise in rebellion. God also did not tolerate Miriam, Moses' sister, complaining about Moses' leadership. Going to the New Testament, we think about Ananias and Sapphira, who told a lie to Peter, but he hadn't lied to Peter, he lied to the Holy Ghost, and God smote them dead. Uh, we should have a healthy respect and even fear for the things of God. And then look at the last phrase there in verse 4. Ye have not passed this way heretofore. You have not been here before. You've not done this. You've never done this. So because you've never done this, you need to listen to someone who has. You need to listen to someone who knows the directions, who knows the way. And I present to you point number three as an outspring of this. And that's filled in on your outline already. But to have what you've never had, you'll have to do what you've never done. Dave Ramsey, the financial advisor, says it a little differently. He says, if you will make the sacrifices now that most people aren't willing to make, later on you'll be able to live as those folks will never be able to live. He's talking about living a millionaire kind of lifestyle. I don't know that any of us will achieve millionaire status. I mean, I know the military pays amazing. You guys are chuckling like that's some sort of joke. But I could say this. I don't know that any of us will ever achieve that sort of thing. I mean, well, pastor, of course, you know. I mean, you know, but uh, I, I got to preach more Joel Osteen kind of messages and not so much John the Baptist kind of messages, I, probably, to get to that point. <clears throat> Surely the statement that Ramsey made applies to finances down here. But it's also the motto for everyone who has his eyes on the prize of the mark of the high calling of God, as Paul did. If you want to have what you've never had, if you want to have what most people don't have, you're going to have to do what few are willing to do. You know, others may question why you live the way you do. Others may question the standards the convictions that you have for your family. You might abstain from things that other people feel like it's all right to do. I can tell you this, you will never apologize to God for having high standards. However, I do feel like there'll be very many at the judgment seat who will have their heads in their hands for having no standards or no convictions or un insufficient ones. Guys, Sometimes I preach and you may think that certain things that I say sound very extreme. That they sound like things that, Pastor Scott, no reasonable person would be willing to do this. Nobody would go to these lengths. Nobody would be willing, last week even as you mentioned, to give up everything that they have in order to go be the disciple of Christ. No, quite a few do. And you may not be willing, but maybe one day you will. And as we talk about that, about having a higher kind of lifestyle, look at verse 5 now. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Sanctify yourselves. We must be set apart. 
We must be set apart. When God, when God says there, when God said to Joshua, and Joshua repeated to the people, sanctify yourself. Sanctification is holiness. And to make it very practical and plain, we cannot strive to be just like the world and also please Christ simultaneously. We cannot... On, one, on Sundays, we can't sing praises to God, and throughout the rest of the week, we sing top 40 of what's popular in this world. For us to be immersed in all the pop culture and all the things that will one day pass away and then come to church and look into our Bibles for a little while is not the kind of life that is going to yield eternal fruit for God. James chapter 4 says that friendship with the world is enmity with God. God says you've got to make a choice. And if you're going to be serious about following me, yes, I'm asking you to turn from that and turn to me. Verse number, uh, we're going to continue to read here. Joshua spake unto the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in Jordan. That's, a little, that's important for us to see in a little bit. And Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come hither, and hear the words of the Lord your God. And he repeats back to them everything that God said to them. Verse 10, And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. There's an important lesson to learn here. And it's this. For us to see the power of God on full display, there must exist obstacles and enemies that only He can overcome. I gave you the example earlier in the message of Erskine football, undefeated since 1927. We've never lost. Well, you've also never won. For us to see the power of God on full display, there must exist obstacles and enemies that only He can overcome. If you could win the battles over spiritual wickedness in high places, if you could defeat the flesh by yourself, if you could defeat the devil by yourself, the Holy Spirit didn't need to come in and dwell us. We could just do it in our own power. But God places things in our lives so that we have to depend on Him and His power to get victory over them and through them. Our first reaction when things go wrong in our lives is to say, why, God, why would you let this happen? He put it there, or He allowed it to be there, so that you would have to turn to Him and rely on His strength to get the victory. Consider this. I want you to look at the phrase that God said there, that Joshua said, that He repeated from God. Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you, and that He will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites. Consider that a generation before this, these Israelites' fathers were moaning, we can't go in because we're grasshoppers. And on this day, these Jews were enthusiastically reminded, we get to be giant killers. We would not necessarily agree uh, with the faith of our 35th president, John F. Kennedy. We would not have practiced as he does. But the quote that he made still rings true for us. He said, do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men. As parents, we're tempted to remove obstacles and challenges for our children because we think it'll make them happy. You know what it makes them? It makes them weak. Imagine for just a moment that you never, that your child always relied on you to feed them. You're like, oh, okay, well, babies, what are babies supposed to do? They got to, you know, they got, you know, they got to take a bottle, got a nurse, or, you know, you got to airplane and put the food right in there. But what if they were two years old, three years old? Well, I don't want them to have to lift their little arms. 
So I'm going to make sure I put that food right there, right there in the mouth. And I'm going to continue to feed my baby. They never had to walk. They never had to develop. What would happen to those muscles? They would just atrophy through usefulness. And through your effort to remove all the obstacles and challenges from them, you also removed their ability to overcome those obstacles and challenges. And you made them atrophied and weak. If God is a good father, and he is, then he will allow challenges and struggles in our lives, not so that we'll complain and not so that we'll cry, but so that we'll learn to depend on him and we'll develop the strength within ourselves to be able to overcome them. When you look at Olympic athletes with that gold medal, how did they get that? By taking the path of least resistance or by training their body to the point of exhaustion again and again and again? That's what the very best do. And so we in our spiritual walks, to see the power of God on full display, there must be obstacles and trials in our lives. You don't have to raise your hand, but I think I know what the answer would be. How many of you would love to see God perform a miracle that could only be attributed to God? We'd all say, yeah, I'd like to see that. But do you realize for God to bring a miracle and to supply miraculously, there must first be a need? We all want to see the miracle, but we don't want to be the one in such need that only God can fix it, do we? We don't. So when a need comes in our life, when a challenge comes, that's not the opportunity for us to pour mouth and say, oh God, why have you put all this on me? God has put it there so that you can look to Him and say, okay God, I cannot wait to see how you're going to bring us through this one. Continue reading here, verse 11. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe of man. We'll see the purpose that those twelve men serve a little later. Verse 13, And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priest that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from the above. <coughs> and they shall stand upon a heap. A couple of times I have referenced for you a little mini-series called The Bible that aired probably 10 years ago. <coughs> you may not have ever seen these, but they all exist out there on the internet. So I grabbed one of them and cut down a small little clip. What you're about to see in the next slide is a small movie clip that is totally biblically inaccurate. You're about to see a picture of how this particular director thought that God parted the Red Sea for the Israelites. Not the Jordan River, but the Red Sea. You'll see it for yourself because none of the Israelites got wet when they passed through. They passed through on dry ground. And Moses stood on the shore to put a staff in for God to split the waters. So maybe, yeah, maybe I'm just picking it apart. Maybe I'm just being too... But look, if you're going to make a movie and you're going to call it the Bible, it should at least be biblical. So, I'll let you see this clip. Notice where Moses is standing whenever, uh, whenever he... Uh, so you'll see him making his way out through here. He's here. Can't tell if he's in the bank or whatever he goes. And then watch where he's standing right here. In the water, and the water just generates away from him. And then you'll see, oh, the Israelites, oh, wow, look at that. And the water comes up and forms two walls on each side of him. That's not what happened. Moses stood on the bank. The east wind blew all night and created the dry waterway. And you see the waters walled up on each side. That's how it happened at the crossing of the Red Sea. However, at the crossing of the Jordan River, what does it say here, right here in the middle of verse? 13, and it shall come to pass soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord shall rest in the waters of Jordan. This would have been a much better representation of how the Jordan River was parted. However, it's just Hollywood. How accurate can we expect it to be? And just as those priests had to get their feet into the water, so we get our final point. We must be willing to get our feet wet. 
Joshua got the order in verse 8. He gives the command in verse 13. And what he's asking the priests there to do is to have faith that the plan God set in place will do the job and be willing to act on that faith. I was in a missions conference in Jackson, Michigan. Some speaker was up here and he says, I need, I need to get 12 volunteers real quick. And I thought, well, I'm one of the missionaries. I want to get support for this church. Maybe I should be one of the 12 who will get up there. And so I got up there. He misapplied this passage, by the way, not to split hairs, but he had 12 of us get up there. These 12 men did something else. The priest, which were probably four people at the most, bore the Ark of the God on rods that passed through the Ark on their shoulders. But he had 12 of us get up there, and he says, okay, I want you to all get up and line up like this, and I want you to put your hands up just like this, just like you're holding the Ark. So six of us were on one side, six of us were on the other side. And then he says, and I'm going to have you stand here for the remainder of this message. I regretted being one of the volunteers to come up after that, and I probably will never volunteer for anything else in church that I don't know what the thing is I'm volunteering for before I get into it. So I stood there, me along with uh, some other senior citizens that were in the audience that stood up there, uh, and they stood there, and, and let me tell you, you might not think this is much of anything, and you can all do it for a minute or two. You might even do it for five without much discomfort. But you're not going to do it for a 55-minute message without there being some discomfort. So did a little of this, did a little of this, kind of bit my hand a little bit to keep my No, but man, that became exhausting. But they stood there in the river, those likely four priests, and they stood there until everyone passed through. How much were they asked to get into the river? To the neck? <laughs> Enough to keep the ark out of the water? To their waist? How far were they asked to get wet? Just their feet. And God did the rest. Do you remember that I told you that that place called Adam would be important? Continue to read verse 15. And as they that bear the ark were come into Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all its banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city Adam that is beside Zaretan. And those that came down toward the Sea of the Plain, even the Salt Sea, failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. Adam was about 20 miles upstream. When it says there that the water rose up upon a heap very far, uh, a tall mountain of water stood there. God didn't ask him to get into the next or to the race. He said, get your feet wet and I will roll back the Jordan River some 20 miles upstream. And so I come to the conclusion of the message and I ask you this. What do you need to do today to please God with your life? To achieve victory, to fully surrender to God, what would you need to do today? I've created an outline there with a lot of blanks below it. Those blanks are for you and for you alone this afternoon as you ask God that very question. What do I need to do to get victory in my Christian life? Maybe you know you're living and harboring a particular sin in your heart. And you know, I really cannot fully please God until I get this sin out of my life. Put the sin on your paper. But what if somebody sees it? God already knows it. And if you confess it and get rid of it, then it's out of your life. There may be things that you need to surrender. Things that you need to be willing to surrender or say goodbye to. Those might be toys. And suddenly I got the attention of all the children. My toys, I'm talking more about the toys that cost them the thousands of dollars that adults have. Those things that we often use as a distraction from God. It might be those Playstations or Nintendos or things like that that we need to sit down so that we can spend real time in prayer in God's Word. It may be that we need to put aside some sinful habit or maybe a habit that's not truly wrong. It's just something that eats a lot of my time and it causes me to be an unproductive Christian. 
Whatever you put on your sheet, you might view as a monumental task to get past, but God says, get wet, get moving, and I'll provide the power to do the incredible. God wants you to have spiritual victory, and He will do His part if you'll do your part. Get your toes in the water. Be willing to take that first step of obedience, and that next step of obedience will be that much easier. Can I ask you to uh, just bow your heads? Please stand with me. Abigail, just come and play something very softly on, on the piano. You may be here this morning, and you have, you have no idea what it means to live a victorious Christian life, maybe because you don't know what it means to, have, to live a Christian life at all. You've never been saved. If you'd like to trust Christ as your Savior, I'd love to take a Bible and show you how you could be saved this morning. We can come to this side room over here. We can talk after the service. We can talk right there in the pew after everyone leaves out this afternoon. Love to show you what you need to know to be saved. Secondly, I'm speaking to the person who claims to be saved this morning. Sadly, the majority of people who trust Christ are living in the wilderness. Most of them. I'd like to think this church is an exception to that. I'd love to think that most of us are living victorious Christian lives. But if you look at your life and there's no joy, there's no peace, there's constant conflict, there's constant trouble in your spirit. Guys, we can fix that real easy. It's just called putting it all on the altar, giving it to God, and being willing to obey whatever He says to do. Simple as that. If you'd like to come to the front and pray, please do. Otherwise, just do business with God right there in your seats.